1970, British director Ken Russell made a film called The Devils. A film based on a non-fiction book by Aldous Huxley, documenting the rise and fall of a Roman Catholic priest who was executed for witchcraft following the supposed possessions of sexually repressed nuns in a village in France. You're accused of being in league with the devil! When the film arrived in cinemas in 1971, it was met with shock and disgust, and criticism for its disturbingly violent, sexual and religious content. One scene in particular, a scene now simply known as the Rape of Christ, is still not included in any legal version of the film that's available. The Devils was banned in several countries around the world and was heavily edited for release in others. The film was publicly condemned by the Vatican, was given a zero star rating from Roger Ebert and was branded by film critic Judith Christ as a grand fiesta for sadists and perverts. It flies me with caresses, lust for obscene. However, nearly 50 years on, the film is now almost universally praised as a horror masterpiece. And despite the fact that the film still isn't available in its full uncut form, it remains one of the most shocking, controversial, and powerful movies in cinema history. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the occult, and we discuss Ken Russell's infamous masterpiece, The Devils. God bless you. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the evolution of the horror genre by looking at different subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in our fifth series exploring the evolution of the occult in horror cinema, and this is part nine, in which, as the intro suggested, we're just discussing one movie this week, The Incredible The Devils. Uh, Now, I know this is a difficult film to get hold of for a lot of people and it's impossible to get hold of in its full uncut glory Uh, but I would recommend trying to seek out the film before you listen to our discussion because we do discuss the movie in spoilerific detail and we do discuss particular scenes of this movie that you really have to see before you understand what we're discussing this is a movie that has to be seen to be believed Uh, now we've got loads of exciting ground to cover when it comes to this film later on in this episode I'm going to be joined by Craig Lapper from the BBFC who's going to be giving us a little history uh, of The Devils in terms of its initial release, its reception, its censorship, its various cuts, uh, and how that has changed and evolved over the last few decades. Uh, But first of all, to discuss the movie in depth, uh, one of my very favourite people, probably one of my most frequent guests on the podcast, and yet it's it's been so long, too long, since she was last here, so it's a joy to have her back. Uh, She is a film programmer, she makes up one half of The Final Girls, and as of recently, she is now the host of the Final Girls podcast. Very exciting. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to the podcast, Anna Bogatskaya. Anna, welcome back. I'm so happy to be back. I've uh, been feeling so rejected. I haven't done one know, of these in a while. It's yeah. been so long. Um, first of all, we should talk because this is like an interesting crossover because we're talking, I'm talking on this podcast on this series about a cult, about witches and about Satanism and all that kind of thing. And you, you finally, at long last, got the Final Girls podcast up and running and you're kind of covering similar sort of areas, right? Similar, but different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I've been really enjoying the occult series because it goes a bit wider than what yes. we're doing on the Final Ghost podcast. So yes. we did, it just ended last week, actually. Mm-hmm. We did a whole screening series, a season of talks and films um, about witches on screen. So it kind of went from horror films mm-hmm. like Belladonna of Sadness, which is, you know, this weird mm. psychedelic, erotic, animated horror witch film yes. to kind of rom-coms like Practical Magic. So it's a bit broader Love than it. just horror, yeah. but it was very specifically designed to look at witches on screen. And then mm-hmm. we did a whole series of talks as well, which nice. were fascinating. And then the podcast is a companion piece to that where... You know, I've been thinking, you know, I've been thinking for a long time yes. and been obsessed with And I've with been podcasts. like, do it, Anna, do it. Yeah. yeah. And I'm kind of, we finally kind of decided to go ahead with it because this project is just, this subject, A, 
is a big obsession of mine for a very, very long time. Amazing. Um, And also, well, the other big obsession was podcasting, obviously. Mm. But at the same time, the thing with putting on screenings and events is that they're amazing. Yeah. And it's so wonderful to see and connect with people in real life and to experience yeah. films that you may have only experienced on screening links mm. or DVD, to see them on the big screen, to see the reaction with people. It's a completely different yeah. vibe. But that's it. You know, yeah. that stays in the room. And then it's gone and it's over. Exactly. Yeah. And there's so much conversation that you can have with different people, mm-hmm. kind of go a bit more in depth about a film yeah. or a TV show. So that's kind of what we wanted to do. What we're doing with the Final Ghost podcast is we look at a different which film or TV show. Love it. In every single episode. They're about an hour long with different guests every time. Yes. And it is kind of looking at it through a female prism. Mm-hmm. Um, although not to say that it's kind of, you you know, knocking about and jamming feminism down anybody's throat. Yeah, yeah no, totally. It's yeah. kind of similar, similar sort of um, conversations to the ones on this. Like, where you're kind of celebrating yeah. the movies, right? And exactly. Kind of exploring them. Yeah. And it's been so much fun revisiting those witch films as well. So like, there's funny. a. I love occult horror movies, and I love mm. occult movies in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Final Ghost podcast is very specific about witches in the moment. Kind yeah. of, we've got other projects, uh, other kind of seasons planned, but for the next couple of months, it's going to be all about witches because there's just so fucking much. There's so much. And actually, what's really interesting, what I've talked about with a lot of guests so far, is that like like what the films you've covered on your podcast, it does actually go outside of the horror. Yes. Maybe even there's more non-horror than horror when it comes to witch films and occult films and that kind of they thing. They are, you know? yeah. Yeah, rom-coms, for example, and, you know, movies like that. Yeah. yeah, and I think kind of what was what's always been really interesting to me is that kind of the witch is the one sort of horror, I, well, not the one, mm. but the only heavily gendered horror That's figure. That's right. I remember you saying this to me on our Suspiria discussion. Yeah. It's so interesting, yeah. So, you know, this goes way back. Yeah, But it does. at the same time, it sort of crosses over and it appears in musicals, you know, think mm-hmm. of Wicked. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yep, think yep, of yep. like fantasy uh, fantasy stories you yep. know just all the spin-offs of the wizard of oz yes. musical and that terrible and mentionable film mm. with james franco <laughs> um <laughs> yeah. you know two kind of childhood classics that yeah. are traumatizing in their own ways i like mean Hocus so many Pocus. disney films too yeah right? Look at all the wicked oh my witches in disney yeah. films yeah. ursula yeah ursula, ursula exactly. maleficent exactly. Yep. all the good ones so there's there's like a really interesting uh cross section of stuff you know yeah. and there's a lot of hardcore horror that we'll get into some stuff that is sort of more light touch mm. some stuff you know we did a really really fascinating episode with Kelly Weston about the skeleton key oh, yeah. which is more voodoo and hoodoo as opposed to yeah. straight up kind of um, more western w- representations of witchcraft yeah. and kind of I don't know there's just so much to talk about and also then there's all the TV mm. just did a massive episode on Buffy the Vampire Slayer oh my god I'm so jealous which I'm so excited about I, I can't <laughs> even with friend of this podcast Becky Dark right yes. oh my god I can't wait to listen to that she I'm brought so a excited. Dark Willow statue <laughs> Jeez. This house is now blessed. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So that's a good way to start occult movies. And I think it is, especially what I'm doing with occult as an umbrella term, because it's so broad. Yes. And actually, the movie we're about to talk about even, you could argue it's not even occult. It's not even horror. It's almost just this like kind of psychological... I, you know, I don't know what it is, but th- in some ways there is no supernatural elements to mm. Ken Russell's The Devils, is there? It is kind of about human behaviour and power and hysteria and whatever else. So it kind of, yeah, it can cover so much ground. Um, so let's get into it. Let's talk about Ken Russell's The Devils. He plies me with caresses, lust, obscene. He enters my bed at night and takes from me that which is consecrated to my divine right, God, Jesus Christ. And what form does this incubus take? Talk! <laughs> Who is responsible for this evil possession? <laughs> but of course I can prove nothing. This Mother Superior may be little more than a hysterical nun. But if it is a genuine case of possession by devils, and if Grandier himself was proved to be involved, then yes, I think it bears investigation, gentlemen. You've been a magician. If I'd got my good devils. Face. Eternal damnation. Conjecture is useless. We need a professional witch hunter. We must send for Father Barre. Uh, Anna, first of all, what's the what's the devils about? Well, well, 
big themes. Mm. You've summed them up really well. It's about power. It's about hysteria. It's about establishment. Yes. Um, more specifically and plot wise, it's about the rise and fall of the superstar priest mm-hmm. um, called Urbain Grandier, who's played by Oliver Reed. Who's a 17th century Roman Catholic priest who is, spoiler alert, we're doing spoilers in this, yeah. right? Um, spoiler alert, is executed for witchcraft following um, supposed possessions in Loudon, mm. which is in the south of France. And it f- the film entirely focuses on his personality and his rise to power and his popularity mm-hmm. and his own relationship with religion and his faith and God and how he balances that with his love and his lust for power and mm. women. And at the same time, it really focuses on Sister Jeanne d'Ange, which is played oh. by Vanessa Redgrave, who is quite a figure because she is the... Um, she's a deeply repressed nun. She's sort yes. of the... The mother. Yes, she's like the mother superior. The mother superior of this um, Ursuline convent Mm. in Loudon. And she becomes sexually obsessed with Mm. Grandier. She Mm -hmm. is fascinated by him and sort of kickstarts this streak of possessions and hysterical behavior Mm. and accuses him of being the reason for that, of having corrupted her and corrupted by extension the entire convent. And that is what... Um, kickstarts kind of this accusation against him and a whole series of repercussions that are deeply political in nature yeah but essentially culminate in a in witch trials yeah. and a conviction of grand mm. and in the middle there is a whole lot of orgies and a whole <laughs> lot of hysterical behavior there really are yeah naked hysterical nuns uh, so what's your personal kind of history with this movie because I feel like everyone has seen this movie in different forms or in different ways it's had kind of different Different versions, different releases, all of that kind of thing. Um, do you remember the first time you saw this? Well, I'd love to hear what your personal relationship with this film mm. is as well. I think, from memory, I stumbled across The Devils when I was a teenager. Yes. And I was just really into horror, but you know, as any horror fan, sometimes you want to push your own boundaries and yeah. just discover what is the most perverse film out there? Yeah. What is the most fucked up film I could watch? Uh-huh. How can I test my own boundaries yeah, yeah. cinematically? Yeah. And this film kept copping, popping up and it all did. of these film lists and articles that I would read or even kind of books or essays that I discover and they would mention that this film became kind of this mythical figure of, mm. you know, it was banned, it was cut up, yeah. the, the kind of the complete version is so perverse that it's never been seen Mm -hmm. you know the idea as well and i think a lot of cinephiles and film fans and collectors of cinema can empathize with the idea that when a film is discussed in terms of the real final version has never been seen that instantly conjures up this kind of oh amazing detective like curiosity of well i will find it yeah i will go into the deep dark resources on the internet and i will find the uncut version of the 1971 the devils yeah Yeah. um i don't really remember how i saw it i think (laughs) I don't even remember when, probably mm. already in university yeah, here, because yeah. I think it wasn't a th- it wasn't a thing in Spain where I grew up, but sure. certainly when I moved to London um, as a student, I think I discovered it in the library somewhere and in VHS or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't really remember what version of it it was. I've since revisited the film several times and I've watched several versions. The one that I've watched the most is the... Uh, the uncut one basically yeah 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 the one with all the lost footage Mm. that was rediscovered and included in subsequent releases yes 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 it is it's fascinating like the kind of what's included in different versions i think the first time i saw it i guess like relatively late on i think it was after i'd seen like you said I, i guess you know researching as a horror fan what are the most infamous shocking or interesting movies i can seek out and i think there was at some point a documentary by mark kermode about him discovering and piecing together this film and you know finding the lost reel of film and all of that kind of stuff and just seeing clips of it on loads of these documentaries and reading about it in magazines and stuff i I sought it out and so i watched the so the version that because there's still not the full uncut version it's still 
isn't available to buy, which is amazing. So the version that is available is the X-rated cut, uh, which includes a lot of the orgy scenes, but it still has removed the the rape of Christ, is what people call it, which is where they get the big statue of Christ and basically have sex with it. And also a, a scene at the end when Vanessa Redgrave's character masturbates with a bone and that is also removed from the x version so that's the version i've seen with those couple of scenes still cut out um, oh well, i've seen the version with both those scenes already in yeah well yeah. there is i i think there is some dodgy version of it online uh, but there's still no official version of that and i've seen because those scenes are included in the kermode documentary he shows them as part of a documentary but they're still and kermode will talk about this on the podcast but there is there basically it was it's america warner brothers in america still find this film too blasphemous and offensive and will not release the uncut version and for some reason they own the rights and so it means it's not it's not available over here either well they own the uh, rights because they produced it mm, back in the day so that's it's part of their library but i love that i love these histories about films i love when images are deemed so profane and horrifying that they should not be ever seen so funny there's something so intriguing oh. about it it's like what will these images do to me it's, it's so like the funny. tape in the ring right yeah, yeah, it's like, totally. oh, what will happen if i watch it will i become possessed yeah will i will i see the devil yeah what's gonna happen it's just cinema isn't it but that's kind of the power it's amazing of it's mythic. Films it makes it images. mythic i know and particularly a cult right there is yeah. something about it when it when it deals with religion because obviously mm-hmm. after the next film we're discussing after this is the exorcist and that is another film it's like these two back-to-back movies that that blend religion with horror that people thought were j- literally evil like you know all those stories of the exorcist of nuns kind of stood outside theaters in america and kind of throwing holy water on audiences and th- you know that is i'd love to have been around at that time yeah. in the 70s just to, i would have been first in line i think to go see a movie if it had that reputation i mean lest know? we forget um nuns also pick it a dogma so <laughs> yes and just and, saying. and uh life of brian was banned in a lot yeah. of areas in the uk but you're absolutely you know? right there is you know and no disrespect to people of any faith no you know you can have your faith and then and believe and subscribe to whatever religion you choose but there is something about blasphemy yeah. about the idea of someone an artist or a filmmaker whoever creating art that perverts the yeah. permissible images of any yeah. particular religion and in this particular case it's um catholicism mm. which is you know the the imagery that personally i've grown up with the most and i was mm-hmm. not raised catholic but mm-hmm. i grew up in spain so yeah. i was surrounded by that imagery yeah. quite a lot and by quite distinct kind of rites mm-hmm. and possessions and things that just infiltrate daily life sure. that you just take for granted yeah. and it's everywhere so when you're confronted even with the idea mm. of um those images being perverted yeah. into something for entertainment mm. um or kind of for kind of an exploration of ideas that are too taboo to even think about. Yes. There is something that um, Tara Judah, who's an amazing uh, oh, yeah. film critic from The, the Watershed, Watershed yeah. she mentioned something about The Nightingale on an episode of uh, of my podcast where she was like, it's the idea that you don't have to see it, but it's planted in your head. Mm-hmm. And the fact that you're forced to imagine it as mm. a spectator is somehow more invasive than yeah. being than seeing the images themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in a way, you know, I can, I don't relate, but I can empathize with why people get so offended and afraid of films like The Devils or mm. The Exorcist, mm-hmm. because they force them to even, even before they're they're confronted with the actual images, which are very often, you know, not as intense as no. people there's the ones that people conjure up in their heads totally but it's the fact that they make them think about the possibility of this stuff existing or happening that is so terrifying and i think kind of gets people really riled up what i find really interesting about it and we will talk about this with the exorcist is how obviously the writer william peter blatty was catholic and ken russell himself ken russell was was also catholic Catholic. yeah and so that is interesting i mean i guess the first thing i want to ask you is do you think the devils is a blasphemous film or is it just a film about blasphemy you know because i guess there's that subtle difference isn't there well i I mean, I'm not the right person to talk about blasphemous yeah. content because I am an atheist. Sure, sure, <laughs> but, sure. Same. Um, I actually don't think this is a film about blasphemy at all. I think mm. this is a film about pol- about politics, yeah, about power, yeah, about right. lust for power, and about the power of established narratives, yeah, of the power of establishment, whatever form it takes, and that could be 
government. Mm-hmm. That could be organized religion. That could be a particular authority, a uh, figure of authority. Mm-hmm. Be that a priest. Be that a king. Be that a a, a prime minister. Mm-hmm. Whatever. And the narratives that they impose. Yes. And the fact that those become law. Mm-hmm. And those become the only way to interpret reality. Yeah. And the truth then bends. Yeah. If you know what I mean. In yeah. a way. With the 2019 Prism on, you could interpret The Devils as a film about how fake news become... Totally! ...dominate the conversation and have real-life human consequences while completely disregarding reality and the underlying motivations. Mm. I mean, I hope we get into this later on, but Grandier is used as a scapegoat. And, you know, he's not necessarily a cookie-cutter, innocent <laughs> no. type um, character at all. But he sticks to his truth. Yeah. And in actuality, it's quite interesting that he's accused of violating and perverting this this particular nun, mm. Jean, but also the entire convent. Mm. And he'd never even been to that convent. Yeah. He'd never even met these people yeah and he is drawn into and presented as kind of this force of evil Mm -hmm. when that is entirely manipulated information that is used for political gain by people who did not like him Mm -hmm. as a as another political figure yeah yeah totally you're so right uh so there's so much i want to cover with this film let me start off by asking you about just generally Mm -hmm. the look of this film it's the production design was designed by derek jarman yes it was what do you think of just the way this film looks well it's i I love it it's stunning isn't it do you know what i think it's really powerful it's the fact that it feels so undated yes because it lives in a sort of otherworldly reality right it doesn't try to be historically accurate Mm -hmm. too much it's so infused with modernity and obviously Mm. modernity of its time of the early 70s yeah you know even from the haircuts the way they look yeah yeah yeah, the costume design the way they move um some of them look like hippies and stuff they do i mean come on like every single priest gets his sleeves torn off of. They are all there, like sporting the guns while they exercise some nuns. I know. It's Come so on, good. and Oliver Reed looks like like what he was. He yep. was a seventies sex symbol, so, totally, and like totally. the most raucous actor so of the sixties and seventies. It's and like he's looking there. at Burt Reynolds dressed as a priest yeah, or something. Isn't he it? looks like he looks like an aged East London creative director, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you're so right. You're right. It's got a timeless feel, though, hasn't it? Yeah, that's what I love about it, is the fact that it's so within its own world. And also, that's kind of why my, you know, not aside from kind of any religious affiliations, uh, it doesn't seem as offensive in a way because it lives in its own reality, Mm. because the points that it's making, I think, are so much larger than religion or Catholicism or even this one particular story. Lest we forget, this is uh, based on a true story and sort of based on an Aldous Huxley book as well that is a nonfiction book about the possessions of Ludon. And there was also a play, but um, Ken Russell allegedly did not base the film so much on the play because he found it sentimental. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's drawing a lot from from the the Huxley book. Yeah, it is uh, the the design of this village. The way it is this like fort is really interesting as well, right? Isn't it? And it's pretty much apart from one moment, you know, it, it kind of goes off. But really, it's pretty much all set in the confines of this this village, this city wall. And it's uh, also white as well. It's oh. so pristine and kind of claustrophobic as well. It's almost yeah. sci-fiish in it, a way. Yeah, it reminds me a bit to look at of another controversial film from the same year, A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, that kind of like political wacky satire with these bright garish whites and this kind of like but this kind of obscene imagery as well mixed with it uh it is really fascinating and actually tonally it's a weird film right Mm. because yeah it is a horror film but the way it starts you almost think you're watching monty python or something the the way that the kind of people in power are portrayed and the kind of clowning and the wacky characters a most original conception your majesty the birth of venus I pray that I may assist you in the birth of a new France where church and state are one. Amen. And listen, the actual, like, I rewatched it this morning, the horrific bits don't actually start until about an 
hour and a bit in. Totally, yeah. It's a very slow burn kind of um, crucible-esque yes. telling of the story. Yeah. And then shit gets reeled yeah. about an hour and 20 minutes in. Yeah. Do you th- do you consider it a horror film? Yes. Yeah. Do you find it in any way kind of frightening or disturbing or, you no. know? No. No, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> You're just hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> that's just me. I'm like, oh, yeah, breakfast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. There are moments of the torture, sometimes like the tongue clamp thing. And there are moments yeah. like that that you get in a lot of those old 70s kind of, uh, you know, a bit Witchfinder generally and those ki- kinds of movies. That, yeah. And I think it's the disturbing idea, isn't it? That's the thing. I think the language in it is the most disturbing bit. Mm. I think it's the fact you know a lot of it happens off screen there is some quite graphic imagery but it's mostly sexual imagery as yeah. opposed to violence sure. it's it's the conviction yeah it's i think this is kind of the really scary bit for me is when people are so convinced of their own ideas yes. and especially so convinced of their own ideas of the supernatural and of people being possessed by the devil mm-hmm. or of someone being guilty there is no way of convincing them otherwise yeah. and there's a really powerful scene when um, uh, the king arrives and he's in disguise and he gives the uh, the witch finder the uh, the, wi- the the witch finder general I was going to call yeah, him he's not he bad he's the witch that, finder yeah, yeah. Uh, bar he gives him this box that he says contains the blood of Christ and it will you know remove any devils yes and put an end to any possession and just and he knows it's fake and he's doing it for lols yeah. basically yeah yeah he's tricking them yeah but they so believe it that they'll react to it completely earnestly yeah. earnestly you know vanessa redgrave sort of comes out of her possession it's like i'm saved i'm i'm good mm-hmm. and Barb profoundly believes in it and sort of shows this box to everyone as though it w- wielding its power but there is none. So that's the scary bit. It's the fact of how quickly and easily yes. people can be convinced that something is real. Yes, totally. It is, it's got that kind of cult element to it, doesn't it? And th- there is a, a, something I was talking to Charlie Albright about, actually, where he was saying, you know, from his experience that, you know, a cult doesn't just have to mean that you believe in the supernatural. It can be just as much about the power of the mind and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, and yeah, suggestion and, and, and training yourself and kind of discipline of the mind and that kind of thing. Thing. And it does feel like there's an element to that in this, this kind of like group hysteria, this mass psychology and psychosis and that kind of thing. And it's about as well kind of finding the cult leaders. That's why kind of they're so such fascinating people because they yes. learn how to manipulate human emotion and how to really focus it on something Mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. often on themselves yeah but also very often on an enemy and grandeur is really interesting in the devils because all of everyone's energy is focused on him yeah as the enemy as the violator as the one possessed by the devil as the one who's forcing or creating the possessions of the nuns by the devil yeah yeah and none of it all of it you know even as they speak is so clearly blatantly untrue yeah. and he is so kind of aware of the fact that he's not a perfect person he's not a perfect priest mm. and he's deeply disliked by a lot of people in power in positions of power yes. but this particular accusation is not true mm-hmm. and he's very steadfast and kind of saying is saying the fact that he will not confess to something that's not true yeah but that is entirely pointless the fact is that everybody's so convinced Mm -hmm. that he is this enemy figure yeah that's all he will ever be yeah yeah the truth doesn't matter the reasons behind people mobilizing to crucify him Mm. doesn't don't matter Mm -hmm. it's the fact that kind of the focusing of this energy Mm. on to him on to removing him yeah is what's quite cult-like. Scary. And it's something that we're going to look at in a lot of cult movies going forward. And cult movies going forward. Movies like The the Omen even. And this idea that the devil or evil exists in positions of power. And that it's systemic. And that you can't ever beat it almost. And The Devils definitely has that feel, right? I mean, there's yeah. no happy ending for Grandier. Yeah. Do you think we're supposed to like him? Do you like him as a character? Because again, we start off and you see he's, he's this priest. But he's also having sex with women. The way he treats the first one who gets pregnant. Mm. And then he goes off and sort of... I think if it's if it's genuine, like falls in love with and then marries this other woman, Madeline, yeah, yeah. who's played by Gemma Jones, yes, who yes. is Bridget Jones's mother. Oh yeah, of course. Just I wondered. Think. I was trying to think, think, figure out where I recognised her. Yeah. yeah. Um, I. 
do you like him as a character? Yeah. I think, again, this is kind of the really... Oh, this is the kind of the timeless power of the devils anyway. Yeah. It's the fact that Grandier and, you know, obviously the casting of Oliver Reed here is yeah. incredibly important. And he'd worked with Ken Russell before in Women in Love. Yes. So they had kind of that connection already. It's the fact that he is a figure that can be interpreted in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Sure, problematic priest, mm. but also, you mentioned it before we started recording, the original hot priest. He's the original hot priest, He right? is the original hot priest. There's something very, and because it's Oliver Reed, but there's something very attractive and charismatic about him as a character too, He right? is a rock star. Yeah. He plays grandeur like a rock star, the yeah. way he moves, and obviously, you know, his look is very anachronistic, you know. Uh -huh. Like we mentioned before, he looks very 70s. Yeah, he does. But he's also... The the way he talks, the way he moves, the way he seduces women, the way he behaves himself and um, in positions and places of power as well. Yeah. He's just so confident. Yes. And so exuding confidence as well. Totally. And he understands the powers at play, but he sort of chooses to ignore them or mm. chooses to play them. He doesn't kind of, he's not groveling no. at all. And that sort of powerful presence that he exudes becomes really attractive and really menacing to totally. a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, so I love him as a character because he's also, he is the victim in the story and a very rare example of uh, a man being accused of being a witch mm. and being burnt at the stake for it. Yes. You know, usually kind of the stories that we've seen in films, whether they're rooted in the supernatural or whether they're more rooted in historical fact, mm -hmm. are about um, women being burned and accused mm -hmm. of being witches. So this is quite an interesting one. And the fact that it is... Um, that he does go through this internal transformation of kind of falling in love and balancing himself out a bit more and of kind of marrying this woman out of love, not out of any particular gain. Yes. No, he could have married that rich mistress that he had. Yes. Who he got pregnant. Yeah. But that's not what he wanted to do. He was not in love with her. Yeah. Um, so that... <laughs> I think he's great. Yeah, it's interesting. And actually, like you said, there's no, de there's not really any deceit about him, even about his actions in the beginning. That's what I love. He quite openly admits that, oh, it's a ridiculous uh, suggestion that priests should be celibate. I mean, he basically says, doesn't he? He's like, we all yeah. need to love. We all need to. And he's quite... I guess he's, you know, you'd consider him quite modern and progressive. That's that's all, isn't it? And that's why a lot of the other pu more Puritan priests don't like him. You know? And also then when he's being savagely tortured yes. and kind of being trying they're trying to force a confession out of him. Mm. He doesn't confess to stuff that he hasn't done. No, no. He does say, you know, I've enjoyed power. I've enjoyed women. I'm not perfect. I, you know, like he say, he's is basically a sinner. A rock star. <laughs> yeah, like he is a sinner, but he did not do this thing that they're accusing him of. Yeah, yeah. No! Call me vain and proud. The greatest sinner ever to walk on God's earth. But Satan's boy, I could never be. I haven't the humility. And this is why I find really interesting in general, mm. but in films in particular, and I think horror films are particularly good at exploring this mm. under the guise of something completely different. Yeah. Of the difference between religion and faith. Yeah, yeah. Grandier is very secure in his faith, in his own relationship yes. with his God. And without the shackles of all of the rules that come exactly. with that. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's religion. There's yeah. organized religion. And that is presented as kind of, and this might be the blasphemous bit, organized religion is presented as this oppressive, mm -hmm. cult-like, sheep-like mentality of people just con contaminating each other with their hysteria. Yes. You know, Jean d'Ange kind of, she even tries to retract her accusation, mm -hmm. but, you know, she's already kickstarted this thing that has no basis in reality and that really doesn't matter yeah so like this almost ripple effect of just this frenzy of no we need to exterminate this it's a threat to our religious yes. construct yeah not our beliefs because if you know one person is going to rock your beliefs that maybe that's an issue that you have to that's something you have with to yourself. sort out exactly yeah. yeah and not with this figure so it's kind of the externalizing of any sort of guilt or trouble or rockiness that exists in those in those constructions yes onto this one figure of grandier because he rejects some of those constructs yes and is incredibly 
secure in his own faith. Absolutely. He's so secure. And actually going back to the kind of the way he's portrayed, I'm interested to ask you in a minute about the kind of the, the difference in the way the genders are portrayed in this as well. Because obviously there is a lot of female nudity in this film, but mm-hmm. I feel like the camera, it kind of lusts over Oliver Reed. Like, there are moments when it's just like him sweaty in his chest or obviously these like fantasy sequences where everyone's like kneeling before him and kissing his body and stuff. And it really is kind of like, it's a weird mix of kind of male, but also a, a sort of female Female gaze on him, I think. Isn't Mate, it? this is a thirsty film. Yeah, right. This film is like all over Oliver Reed, yeah. and it's I don't. It's so specific, like the casting of him. He is in his prime. You yeah, know, his yeah. hair game is amazing. <laughs> it's so seventies. It's amazing. His mustache thing yeah, yeah. is going on. He looks like a hungover musketeer. <laughs> it's unbelievably hot. <laughs> and then, like, he's so. <laughs> you're right. He's always like a semi nude. Yeah, being worship yeah. but also kind of bored with it yeah. he's such a rock star <laughs> yeah. um but i find it really interesting that it's it's all about sexual repression right especially in jean's character yeah and i don't think we should separate grandeur from jean d'ange because she from the very beginning her kind of this whole plot is kickstarted by her yeah. seeing him mm-hmm. and literally her eyes just glaze over she's so head over heels in lust for Oliver Reed in this film and she's so repressed as well and I think the way that she's characterized you know she from the very beginning she has got a hunchback Mm -hmm. and we see her more often than not in this sort of in the sort of white cage yes so she talks to other prospective nuns through these um bars on her window yeah. she's all dressed in this very kind of you know the the nun uniform mm-hmm. probably blaspheming right now but still yeah, yeah, yeah um kind of all in white but she's so mocking yes and so mean and cruel yeah. to madeline respect for black weeds very becoming that's such a pretty rosary it was my what says Oh, yes, the imitation of Christ. (laughs) Solid silver and downcast eyes. (laughs) Hiding what? Virtue or lechery? (laughs) So you have one sin at least, the sin of pride. Do you know why most of us are here? Because you love our Lord Jesus Christ and wish to serve him. Most of the nuns here are noble women who have embraced the monastic life because there was not enough money at home to provide them with dowries. (laughs) Or they were unmarriageable because ugly, a burden to the family. And then when she finds out that Madeline's actually in a relationship with Grandier, she goes absolutely nuts. She goes berserker with jealousy. She's literally like this cat in heat who you know, is so fascinated and attracted to him, but Mm -hmm. she's stifling down and suppressing her own desire. Mm -hmm. But it just sort of has to emanate from her in in one way or another. And it emanates from her as cruelty and as meanness and also visually manifests itself through her putting herself in these enclosed oppressive spaces, that cage office that she's in. Her, even her whole body is oppressive. Yeah. You know, her whole body is sort of contorted to stifle her that even that hunch you know initially i thought that it was almost like she had this kind of cricked neck because she's in such a small confined space the whole time it's almost like you visit she can't actually even stand up straight in that tiny little sort of cave that she's confined in you know Uh, do you do you find any of it how how do you find it especially watching it now in the context of 2019 that essentially this story is about a woman accusing a man of sexual assault or something that he didn't do he's the innocent one she's this lying hysterical woman essentially and that's kind of the story right i mean and 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 i guess the portrayal of all of the women all of the nuns as just these kind of sex hungry hysterical animals almost especially as the film progresses you know that's a very good question (laughs) it's a very complicated one it is a very complicated one i feel like what it's ultimately saying as well is that these women are being so unbelievably controlled and restricted that it's created this behavior right he's the man who's also part of organized religion and yet he's allowed to put it about and have sex they're not and they are literally kept in a cage and that's what happens you know i think there's an element of 
you know, I don't think this is necessarily a film about consent mm, mm-hmm. um, at all. And it's using accusations as of kind of um, of violation. And it's not even kind of termed as assault. Yeah. It's termed as, oh, God, what is the word that they use? Of defilement. That's right. Yeah, that's and true. It's actually quite a sexually violent film towards mm. Jean Donge. There's a few oh, scenes the, the, that are the very... The syringe thing is really Yeah, horrible. where she is actually physically violated by the people who, by the, the church, mm-hmm. who are there supposedly to protect and avenge her, mm. uh, her supposed assault by Grandier. Mm. But there's also, you know, she, you could interpret her as accusing him of assaulting not her body but her mind of filling her with impure thoughts yes of suggesting something in her that again has a lot to do more with repression of female sexuality than Mm. it does with grandeur as a man or as a figure that represents more than than just himself it's about her grappling with her own desire for him. Yeah. It's about her looking at him and him conjuring these thoughts and desires in her that maybe she has not experienced before and that are so intense yes. that she perceives them as devilish, which is another kind of very um, you know, traditional thing that we see a lot in horror films of kind of female mm. bodies and female sexuality and female desire being deemed yeah. demonic, totally. you know, because uh, it's impure, mm. because it's not womanly, mm-hmm. because it's not proper. Yeah. And, you know, when if we're talking about nuns and stuff, this is elevated to a thousand of like, right. they are uh, supposed to be chased. They're the brides of yeah. Christ. Right. Again, look at those costumes, completely white and covered from head to toe. Or the only bit of flesh you see is a face, basically, exactly. and nothing else. So even the idea of uh, of nuns taking their clothes off, which yeah. they do a lot in this film, <laughs> is sort of so transgressive because yeah. you're not supposed to not just desire them, but even see them. You're mm. not, they're not supposed to be seen. So I think there's it talks a lot more about repression of female mm. sexuality mm. and about projecting your own unresolved issues onto someone else because it's so much easier to externalize Mm -hmm. complicated feelings around sexuality and desire than it is to accept those yeah and become more self-aware of of kind of of your own desire and sexuality mm-hmm. and Jeanne Dunge is just a really exaggerated version of that she's mm. kind of the perfect conduit for a filmmaker like Ken Russell who is very extreme in his imagery and yes. in his filmmaking I mean I'm a big fan of his films but he's sort of like um the the king of extreme aesthetics. Yeah, yeah. He's not the king of subtlety, is he? <laughs> no, no, no. But he uses this extreme imagery to illustrate quite broad and intense themes yeah. that very often are a lot bigger than the actual stories that he's yeah, telling. I, so yeah. you always have to think about it kind of in a in a much wider sense, not yeah. just, oh, it's about nuns and a priest and is it totally. about a nun accusing a priest of uh, assaulting her. It's it's about so much more a much different type of relationship. Yeah, Ken Russell himself said actually that he thinks of the Devils as his only political film yes. he ever made. Yes. Uh, and I think it is, you know, from his perspective, this idea of the danger of church and state being mm-hmm. married to each other. But yeah, I think you're totally right. I get the feeling that Ken Russell feels the same way about Grandier is that, you know, even though he is a man of faith like Grandier, he knows the dangers, like you said, of organised religion and of oppressing human desires because I think that, you know, Ken probably believed the same as Oliver Reed's character, which is that, right, even if you're a Catholic, you should still be able to be in love and have sex and, you know, and uh, otherwise, you know, the way that they're treating these these nuns especially, look at what that can result in. If human... If, you know, human nature is completely kind of caged and squashed and oppressed, you know? But also there's, you know, we can compare this film to The Crucible, yes. which there's very similar thematic yeah. and political themes. At the same time, plot-wise follows quite a similar um pattern of you know a, a girl accusing in the case of the crucible a married right. man of of um of raping her and of kind of you know creating impure thoughts in her as yes. well um and that kind of 
generates this mass hysteria mm. in in a small town so it's fair it's a very good parallel and then even of something more recent like carol molly's the falling i was thinking of the of, falling yeah you know this mass hysteria generated by this one figure and then everybody just sort of latches onto it and it's an element as well of oh do we want to just be part of this thing that is happening yeah of kind of this not cult-like mentality but group mentality yeah. of oh this is happening someone else is having a fit and then it's actually quite it's very interesting to see how that is so contagious in religious spaces because mm-hmm. of the high intensity of emotions mm-hmm. and even of um, just a huge concentration of people. I actually went to a ev- Christian evangelical rally one time when I was wow. in university to cover it. And literally it became a like a scene from the devils where people were thrashing around falling down having fits and you know you can't say that they're not genuine Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they were just sort of being not egged into it but sort of it was being it was so contagious of people just leeching off of kind of the the vibe and the energy not just in the room and what was being said by the pastor or whoever the leader is in this case it's the the witch hunter bar mm-hmm. um but also off of each other mm. you could it's almost unavoidable and yeah. that's kind of the that hysterical group thing mm-hmm. is what's so fascinating in the devils and yeah. i think that's ultimately kind of the theme that ken russell is exploring yeah he's just using this really violent really graphic really blasphemous <laughs> and erotic imagery to explore it totally. because it's very assaulting and it just well it makes you listen and it makes you look and you yeah, cannot look away yeah. but at the same time it's so obviously not about that yeah yeah, yeah, you're so right. It's so interesting. And I guess, you know, if you really want to talk about who, if there is such a thing in this film as kind of the good guys, the bad guys, the villains are these people of power, right? The, uh, the, the villain the, is the establishment. It man. is, it it's is. The 70s. And it's, it's the horrible, creepy witch finder and it's the, the, the prince and all of those. Oh, I love the witch hunter. Oh my God. I love him. He's so funny. He's so, <laughs> it's just, it's bonkers, isn't it? The film gets more and more bonkers. Yeah. And we should talk about these like orgy scenes that happen because, my God. You're accused of being in league with the devil and in obstructing Father Barre's cure to Sister John. You rebel against the will of the church, the will of Christ, and the will of his most holy representative, Cardinal Richelieu. And in resisting officers of the crown in the pursuance of their duty, you are also guilty of treason. You are unrepentant heretics. There is no act more vile. You are traitors. You will be executed now. It still is quite shocking and powerful. In, in, yeah, you know. no, absolutely. I mean, the the group scenes in particular, the ones where people are just going mental, mm-hmm. are really powerful because it's so oppressive. Yeah, yeah. You, is a terrible comparison but it's like you know when you're stuck in a place surrounded by a lot of people yeah in whether it's in a confined space or more in an open place mm. it's really scary yes it's really scary because you're completely out of control because of how the mob mm-hmm. just the sheer volume of bodies mm-hmm. kind of takes you with them yeah as if you're stuck in a river and you cannot you just you're just forced to continue with the stream whether mm-hmm. you wanted to or, you wanted to or not and the devils in those very graphic scenes really visualizes that yeah you know it's not just about the nuns you know rubbing themselves up against a, a figure of christ or mm. religious candles and all the sacrilegious shit that they get up to mm. It's about the fact that it's this momentum that is unstoppable. Yes. And it's so scary to visualize. To, Ken Russell visualizes kind of these masses of bodies. And also at the beginning of the film, he has some really stark images of just cadavers, just mountains of cadavers yeah. that have been of people that are have died because of the plague. Yes. And that's quite contrasting because that's also a whole lot of naked bodies. Mm-hmm. But, you know, inert and dead. And, and totally. that's in contrast with these prim, proper, and sometimes over-the-top kind of glossy gold mm. spaces of power. Mm-hmm. And also the way that these people who are supposed to be take- 
care uh, caretakers of health yeah be that mental spiritual or physical health yeah of the way that they're abusing people's bodies yeah there's a really horrible scene where they're not torturing where they're supposedly helping a woman who is afflicted with the plague oh my god and grandeur the comes in yeah and grandeur comes in and just like slaps them around and mm. throws all that shit out and tries to help this woman but they're just torturing her yeah. and that's presented not as torture it's presented as medicine yeah and those are the scenes actually that i find most horrifying me too rather me too. than kind of the the, the non-orgy scene yeah because of the parallels of just this actually the the people in the positions of power don't know what they're doing yeah and they're using their positions of power to just get away with a lot of really heinous stuff Mm -hmm. yeah that stuff is so disturbing isn't it and it's the kind of glee those two guys the doctors or whatever they are doing that thing with the hornets and they pop up again later this kind of like glee that they have at kind of causing this harm and this torture particularly towards women in the film as well isn't it and i think there is definitely an element of that throughout yeah there's a sadism in a lot of the male characters i think and the way they treat these women and these nuns and yeah Vanessa Redgrave's character, except uh, in Grandeur, I don't think he's not in him at all. Sadist at all? No, he's very. He's just a horny. He's just a horny priest, horny basically. Priest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of horny characters in this, basically, isn't it? It's 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 essentially don't uh, oppress your horniness is <laughs> is the message of this film, you know. Uh, <laughs> the, the the you know, and the way that the orgy scenes are portrayed. Again, compared to some of the moments we talked about near the beginning, like the kind of fantasies with Oliver Reed, I don't think these are actually that erotic or sexual it, it, which sounds ridiculous but, they're, but they're, scary. they're more animalistic or something aren't yeah. they I think in the documentary I saw one of the extras was talking about how she was told to they were told to almost impersonate at one point one of them is like a monkey like hanging off something off the roof and they're kind of crawling around jumping on things and they are literally kind of they've become animals at this point, haven't they? Just kind of like base animals. Yeah. yeah. And it's really fascinating. Um, and then we get to all of the actual, the the horror stuff, I suppose you want to call it, which is more the kind of the interrogation of Grandier, the torture, the uh, the burning him at the stake and all of that. And that, the, the kind of final act of the movie, how do you think that's handled? There's a lot of torture. There's a lot of torture. Uh, there's also a lot of very intense dialogue. And essentially yes. it's Grandier being force coerced to confess mm. and his kind of sticking to his guns yes and it's the ultimate test of faith for yeah. him mm-hmm. it's and i found there's uh, some humor in those scenes as well especially in the scene where his hair gets cut off oh yeah and he's mocking the person who is going to be his barber yes he's the surgeon and he's mocking bar and he asks to for a mirror yeah you know he's so confident in his righteousness in that Mm -hmm. moment that the torture you know he sort of disassociates Mm -hmm. very visibly from the torture and you know it's obviously painful but there's such strength in his performance yes it's almost it's we don't see that much violence we see in the in the the cut that i've seen mm. and i know this has kind of been excised from other versions of mm. the film you see his tongue being pricked right yeah um with needles and kind of the the reason that he's not bleeding is deemed as kind of a surefire yeah. sign that he's the Classic. devil yeah um you see him being hobbled mm-hmm. um by bar you see kind of the frustration of the people who are torturing him mm-hmm. at him not confessing yes at him disassociating from the pain and being like this means nothing you cannot rattle my faith and my relationship with god um this is just this is just another test yeah and that's really powerful and it's horrific but it's horrific not in a really occult kind of way it's Mm. horrific because it confronts you with the idea that you know a lot of these means of extricating truth from people Mm. are so damaging but Mm -hmm. so sadistic but also guided by reasons that have nothing to do with the truth and nothing to do with faith and nothing to do with doing the right thing they have to do with something else and sometimes they have to do with like just the internal sadism of certain people in certain positions yeah and it's interesting to compare this to a film that has nothing to do with horror called The Report, which has just been out in oh cinemas God, yeah. now. I just watched that last night. Yeah. Which, you know, is all about how we, well, how the American government justified system, systematic yeah. torture. I mean, if you want to talk, you know, 
t- torture scenes, that film has some pretty horrific ones in the first half as well. Well, difficult to watch, you know, yeah. in that same sort of way. You're right. That's why this film has actually aged very well, I think, The Devils. Yes. In some ways, this has more in common with folk horror, I would say, like The Wicker Man, like Witchfinder General, where it's like organised groups of people in this kind of sectioned off village you know this remote place and this weird shit that goes on and this burning at the end it, it does feel more like, yeah, like and, and the it's, devil is the people basically. yeah the devil is the people and it's and it's the the nihilism of it but it's interesting that actually you know I would have loved to talk about this film on the witches book after there aren't actually any witches no, in this exactly that's what's really fascinating there about actually it. if you think about it there is no occult business going on nothing nothing there are no there are no devils in the devils unless we count the people of power you know there's that shot at the beginning isn't there where the title comes up on the the prince and it just comes up the devils and it's like it's it says from the start what this is really going to be about yeah, doesn't it yeah you know? but it's just to echo what you were saying it's so right it's so timeless because you know mm. we're comparing it to stuff like the falling to mm-hmm. stuff like the crucible yeah stuff like the report it's a political film totally that's using kind of religious uh imagery a real story but also this you know it's timeless in its design and its direction yeah but yeah. at the same time it's it's using the traps of what is expected from a, a religious slash occult horror film yes to talk about something a lot bigger and yes. a lot scarier which is human nature totally I, I mean that was going to be my last question to you similar you've kind of already answered it but I was going to say you know how has this film aged it's what 40, 40 nearly 50 years old this film do you still think it holds up oh hells yeah 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 100 like everything that I just said I think 100% holds up but actually I think it's even more scarily relevant mm. in 2019 mm-hmm. now and as as I mentioned before always fascinated by what people find offensive and repulsive it's so fascinating and i think that has changed you know that has changed although weirdly yeah you still yeah. can't get the full version even yeah because you know we've been we've seen images in cinema mm. and reality that mm-hmm. are a lot more disturbing and harrowing than anything that is in the devil yes so it's fascinating to me that there's still bits of it that may not have seen the light of day because people find it too blasphemous and too extreme. Mm. And the really interesting part of that is that is it blasphemous and extreme because it's confronting us with some ideas about human reality and human yes. nature that are just too difficult to confront. Yeah, oh, totally. And I, I've got a lot of friends that were kind of not necessarily as into horror who were put off by the idea of this film because I think a lot of people lump it in the same category as the video nasties or other movies, kind of exploitation movies of the 70s that were banned. But then, you know, like I was having a conversation with a friend about it. He's like, oh, no, I've not seen, you know. And I was like, well, you know, it is like it stars Oliver Reed and Vanessa Redgrave and it's directed by Ken Russell. And they're like, oh, you know, because I think it, yeah, it almost has this reputation as being something a bit like, I don't know, I spit on your grave or, you know, one Mate, of those it's types the of the original movies. elevated genre movie. It is. It is. It's, it's, you know, and Oliver, I think it's Oliver Reed's best performance. I think oh. he is stunning in it, especially towards the end. Those moments when he is burning yes. at the stake. It's so powerful. I think that's the other thing about you know despite how wacky this film is oliver reed plays it dead straight from beginning to end doesn't he so does everyone in the film yeah Yeah, everyone everyone. yeah Yeah. vanessa redgrave is chilling in this film i feel like we've not really praised her enough in this but she is incredible isn't she she? is like just scary and chilling and almost wicked almost it sounds horrible to say but she is almost monstrous at times in the way she's portrayed and the way she plays it and then other times so sympathetic I find it, you know I find it really sad so sad so, sad so because sad. she because her repression is so intense yes but also she's so mocking of the convent sometimes mm. there's a really intense scene where she's talking to madeline where she you know mocks her desire to join the yes. the nunnery and be like do you know who's really here mm. it's like rich women who are not rich enough yeah or rich enough to kind of marry good husbands or are too ugly or yeah. have done something like yeah. this is not yeah. a house of god basically yeah and she's so mocking but so devout to that power and mm. it's that internal battle within her that is you know externalized by the way that she moves she's always sort of crooked Mm. because of the the hunchback yeah she's always kind of in this really tiny horrible room where she's always exposed but also unable to really you know properly touch anyone Mm -hmm. and her obsession with grandeur 
I think is just this. It's fascinating how it's visualized as well. Yes. Because she wants them so much. And actually, she published her memoir, the real life Jean Dange, mm-hmm. published her memoir. And there was something that she wrote in it that was so fascinating. She wrote this thing in her in her autobiography that said, when I did not see him, I burned with love for him. And when he presented himself to me, I lacked the faith to combat the impure thoughts and movements that I felt. Mm. It's so about her own internalized horniness. Totally. Just she, let it go, she Vanessa. Really, it should just get... She just I've just really wanted her to get laid you know <laughs> <laughs> so sad uh, such a good movie amazing um, thank you so much Anna my last question for you this is a hard one what's your favourite occult movie oh dude come on <laughs> uh, definitely Rosemary's Baby mm. definitely The Craft mm. Eve's Bayou oh uh, That's a beautiful film, Eve's by you. Beautiful, Southern mm. Gothic. And I'm going to say The Witches as well. Uh, which one? Roald Dahl or Hammer? Or- <laughs> Roald Dahl. Yeah. Yeah. Roald yeah. Dahl. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so excited. I'm going to be talking There's about a that lot. in a few weeks' time. There's so much. There's the Witches so much. of Eastwick. I mean, I'm just going to name the ones that I'm going to be talking about. But yeah. yeah. Love it. Amazing. Anna, thank you so much for joining me. Thank this you has for been having so much me, fun. Um, if people want to continue hearing to hear you talk about witches, where can they find your podcast and all the usual places? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So The Final Girls is not just doing screenings now, we're also doing a podcast and we're publishing that every week and it's on itunes spotify stitcher ever else where you find your podcast and we publish an episode every week looking at a different witch film or tv show and that's including horror and not so horror love it thank you very much a big thank you there to the brilliant Anna Bogutskaya. And don't worry, Anna will be back again, I'm sure, on the podcast very, very soon. And in the meantime, if you want to hear more of Anna, please, please do check out her brilliant uh, new podcast, The Final Girls. You can hear her talk about other occult movies and witchy movies and a whole bunch of other stuff with loads of brilliant guests. And you can find that in all the usual places where you find podcasts. Of course. Where's Helena? She was pining back of sodas earlier, but she looked really good. She's... We shouldn't have let her go back by herself. She's fine. Come on, live a little. That was a little clip you heard just there from Black Christmas, not the original Black Christmas from 1974, which is of course the greatest slasher movie ever made, not the remake of Black Christmas that came out in 2006, which of course is one of the worst movies ever made, but another new version of Black Christmas, which is out in cinemas right now. This is the Blumhouse uh, sort of recreation, reboot, whatever you want to call it, uh, of Black Christmas, which has received, I think it's fair to say, say mixed reviews, if I was being kind, uh, since it came out in cinemas last week. Now, over on Patreon, you can hear me and Rihanna Dillon discussing the movie in depth. What did we make of this movie? How does it live up to the original? Is it any better than the terrible 2006 remake? We discuss this movie in spoilerific detail over on Patreon. If you want to check that out, you simply need to subscribe to our Patreon channel. For the very low price of $5 per month, you can help support the making of this podcast and you can also be treated to weekly bonus episodes so this week as i say we'll be discussing black christmas last week as it was friday the 13th i was joined by the hosts of the journey through sci-fi podcast to discuss jason x that was a really really fun discussion and there's a whole bunch of other bonus episodes you can go back and sift through and listen to so if you want to sign up go to patreon.com slash evolution of horror if you donate five dollars per month you'll get all of these extra extra episodes to listen to and if you're UK based you'll be sent an evolution of horror sticker in the post and everyone who signs up also gets a very special thank you shout out on the podcast speaking of I'm going to give everyone a little thank you who signed up and subscribed to the Patreon page in the last couple of weeks so a big thank you to Michael Toomey Danny JP Gemma Michael Jared Kibler Meredith Bell Nicola Peters Veronica Sixsmith Sarah Forsgren and Alex Oh god, I'm going to 
to massacre this. Alex Pelochevic. Uh, I'm really sorry if I completely massacred that name. A huge thank you to all of those people uh, for subscribing to our Patreon channel in the last couple of weeks. And one more time, if you want to get involved and sign up, simply go to patreon.com slash evolution of horror. That's patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Okay, now as we head into the second half of this episode, I've got a very, very exciting conversation to bring you. I went and visited the BBFC in London. That's the British Board of Film Classification. These are the guys who watch every single movie that's released in cinemas, and they decide what certificate a movie gets, whether it's a 15, an 18, a 12, a PG, a U, etc. Now, the movie that we discussed this week, The Devil's as we went into, it had a bit of a kind of tumultuous relationship with film censors and censorship boards around the world. Not only that, the next movie we're going to be covering on our occult series, William Friedkin's The Exorcist, of course, had a similar reputation. Both of these movies have a strange history in which they've been banned in certain countries and cut in other countries and released in various different forms and different prints over the years. So I thought this was the perfect time for me to sit down and have a little chat with someone at the BBFC. So I spoke to Craig Lapper, he's one of the senior examiners over at the BBFC, and we discussed both Ken Russell's The Devils and ahead of next episode, William Friedkin's The Exorcist, in order to get a little bit more information about the history between those two movies and the BBFC. So here is my chat with the brilliant Craig Lapper. Okay, I'm welcoming back to the podcast, Craig Lapper. Hello, Craig. Hi. Hello. Nice Lovely to have you back again. Um, just remind us, um, for, for, for sort of people that may not sort of know anything about the BBFC and how it works in your role here, tell us a little bit about sort of what you do and what your role is here at the BBFC. Yeah, so the chief role of the BBFC is to classify films for cinema release. So we're the people that put them into U, PG, 12A, 15, 18. Uh, and we also classify uh, works that are released on video, so DVD, Blue, Ray, as well as some online content now. Uh, and my role here is to check the reports that are written by our compliance officers and also to attend things like advice viewings where we give a view on what category of films likely to get or any edits that should be made at an early stage. Fantastic. Uh, so I wanted to ask you specifically about sort of two key movies from the 1970s, very important in the horror genre, and I think also have had quite a history in terms of kind of releases and restorations and re-releases and different versions and different kinds and all that kind of thing. So I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about that. Um, Just as a sort of backdrop, first of all, as a history, tell me a little bit about the BBFC at the time in the 1970s, how different it was to now sort of the rating system, the certificates and that kind of thing, because it was quite different, I imagine. Yeah, so... During the 1960s, we'd had a system of three classifications. There was the U, everyone's familiar with. There was an A, which meant that under 16 should be accompanied. And then there was an X, which at the time meant that you had to be 16. Um, As more explicit films came out of America, once they changed their rating system, and as more explicit films were coming out of Europe, the board started struggling with those films at the X category. So in the early 70s, the BBFC changed the rating system system so we would now have a u an a which is very similar to the modern pg just meaning that parents might not be happy with under 14 right. seeing the film but they could take them then a double a meaning 14 and then the x was raised to 18 mm. and the theory was that as we were getting more challenging content fewer films would have to be cut for the x classification aha uh-huh, right uh, but in practice that didn't happen <laughs> uh, but but it but it did make it a bit easier for the bbfc to deal with those stronger types of films that were coming in Yes, well, films certainly were getting stronger, yes. weren't they? I mean, even if you look at in the, in the same year as The Devil, 1971, mm. you had uh, obviously A Clockwork Orange and yep. Straw Dogs yep. and movies like that. It, yep. was, it must have been quite a time for the yes. BBFC. Yes, I definitely. Um, so we had stronger films coming in. We were passing stronger material at the new X18 level category. We also had a bit of a backlash because the films were being criticised by local authorities and by mm. pressure groups. And at the same time, unfortunately, we had our long-serving secretary, John Trevelyan, stepping down right. and then a new secretary turning up. And, of course, the problem with that was Stephen Murphy, who was our new secretary, arrived at the time all this was happening. Mm. And it did create a bit of an impression, especially in that first year with the Clockwork Orange, The Devils, uh, Straw 
Raw Dogs, Last Tango in Paris, all these films turning up at once and being banned by some local authorities, it created an impression that perhaps Stephen wasn't doing a very good job, which was rather unfortunate. Yes. And that led to him having a really torrid time in those first few years of the 70s really? and, and leaving uh, leaving in 1975. So, so yeah. you know, he was only the head of the BBFC for four years. Quite a short, short, yeah. short shift. Yeah. Yeah. And then he decided to leave and go back to the world of TV regulation, which he thought would be a bit safer and easier. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of a kind of secretary was he? What were his kind of sensibilities, I suppose? Well, I think he tried um, as well as he could mm. to stress the fact that the BBFC was trying to be more accommodating of yeah. passing material for adult audiences but he was just facing a very tough time in yeah. terms of the social attitudes in the country and that kind of uh, reaction against some of those stronger films in some quarters just meant that he was having a very difficult time but if you listen to interviews with him at the time he's surprisingly frank and honest Yes, and he often says things like um, sometimes we'll be wrong, sometimes we'll be right and it's for the public to decide and he could also be very frank in his replies to pressure groups and to members of the public. Uh, when you look back at the file on The Devils, it's notable that he often signs off by saying to complainants, go and see The Devils, it won't corrupt you. Ah, so interesting. He, he could be a surprisingly frank and honest person, I yeah. think, which which played well with some people but yeah. perhaps less well with other people. That's interesting. But, you know, he was operating in a really challenging environment. I bet. I mean, wh why do you think that is, you know, I mean, culturally, why why was cinema getting so much stronger in this mm. era, do you think, in the UK and in the US especially? Well, I, th I think it was just social changes yeah. generally in the 60s had led people to push the envelope filmmakers, mm -hmm. perhaps especially um, in Europe but to some extent yeah. in Britain with uh, the previous secretary, John Trevelyan relaxing the rules in line with the spirit of the times. Right. But I think by the time you reached 1969, 1970, attitudes in some quarters were starting to harden mm. just at the point that censorship restrictions were being relaxed. Yeah. So you were getting more explicit stuff and you were getting more criticism and condemnation. So yes. that, th those sort of social changes during the 60s were facing a bit of a backlash by, by that point. I can imagine. So tell me a little bit about The Devils then. Uh, the mm. Devils from 1971 and it, a, a kind of brief history, I suppose, of, of its classification and, and kind of yeah. what that movie went through. Wow. Um, it's a very <laughs> long history. Yeah. It's a very complicated history. Um, the Devils was originally seen by John Trevelyan, actually, who right. was the secretary through the 60s. And he saw it for advice at a rough cut stage. Okay. He watched it a couple of times, uh, once on his own and then with the board's president. They recommended um, the cuts were going to have to be made to the film. Of That's uh, something of a something of an understatement. But but <laughs> but I I, I think uh, John Trevelyan and our president uh, Lord Harlick both felt that although the film was very Ken Russell in terms of how frank its, its depictions of sex yes. were, um, that the film was fundamentally sincere and that it was trying to say something honest about religious hypocrisy, mm -hmm. intolerance, the way in which religion can be manipulated by some people for their own ends. Mm -hmm. So I think their view was that what Russell was trying to do albeit in a very Russell way, mm. was fundamentally sincere. Yes. And so they did want to pass the film. But of course, the BBFC's position with cinema is the final authority lies with local authorities. And so the BBFC had to try to be sure that local authorities would find our decision acceptable. Right. And there were concerns that a, a large number of local authorities probably wouldn't find the film acceptable in its full version. The other complicating factor was in the middle of the BBFC looking at the film at the advice stage, the film was also being viewed by studio executives in, in the States and the studio executives had their own objections to the film, mm -hmm. which were passed on to the BBFC. So the BBFC was attempting to produce a version of the film that would be acceptable to the board's examiners, to local councils, to public opinion yep. and slightly unusually to the studio who'd made the film yes. and had made it very clear that there were aspects of the film that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know how much was actually taken out of the film before it was classified, but um, it would certainly be several minutes and there were a few sequences that were removed or shortened. Yes. Uh, and just tell us a little bit more, just um, again, for, for people who aren't familiar, the way that it works with local authorities then. Mm -hmm. So you guys will kind of advise mm -hmm. or you will give something a certificate mm -hmm. and then it's up to the sort 
of local areas, right, to decide yes. whether or not they want to screen yeah. it. Is that right? Yeah. At, at the time, the way the legislation worked was that the ultimate authority lies with the local authority, mm-hmm. and it's up to them whether a film can be screened. Obviously, trying to get a film through you know, three, four hundred local authorities around the UK yes. is a huge nightmare, yeah. which is why the BBFC was set up in the first place, to provide some some level of uniformity mm-hmm. and make it easier for distributors to get a film released nationally. But local authorities did retain that power. They still do retain that power mm. to disagree with us. So one thing the BBFC has to be conscious of is, are the local authorities going to agree? Because if most local authorities disagree with the BBFC, then it undermines the point of us viewing the films in advance. Right, right, right. Uh, so that's very much how it works. Mm. And with The Devils, I think there was so much sensationalist press at the time <laughs> yes. around it uh, that did draw the attention of local authorities especially with the new stronger X certificate that mm-hmm. we, we were issuing the adults only X certificate um, and once the film was released several local authorities did ask to see the film mm-hmm. and some of those local authorities agreed with the BBFC some of the local authorities disagreed and that did mean that uh, even though we'd classified the devils it wasn't available in some, some local authority areas yeah so I think I, I can't remember the list off the top of my head mm. but I think some Scottish authorities banned it mm-hmm. I think it was banned in Glasgow I think it was banned in Tunbridge Wells <laughs> Cambridge you know all sorts of yeah. authorities had the film in to check what the BBFC was doing really and decided yeah that they didn't think it was appropriate to play in those areas God. of course you know once you get a film banned in one area not only does it create extra notoriety for the film which it certainly did in this case but also it, it encourages people to take the bus oh, from, yeah. you know, from the neighbouring authority to go I and see imagine. this film's banned in Tunbridge so I'll go down the road to wherever to see the film yeah. which sort of enhances this feeling that there's there's something quite strange about the film and that it's it's risky and it's daring yeah. and you know I need to see this so the the, 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 the perverse aspect of the local authority situation <laughs> is unless all local authorities object you can always go to see it you know, down the road so yeah. is it a myth or is this true I've heard that in the uh, city of Westminster Life mm-hmm. of Brian is still banned it's still not allowed to no be I don't think Westminster I think there was maybe an authority in Wales right, that right. was holding out <laughs> I, it might have been Swansea I think all the you know restrictions on life of Brian have been lifted now but, yeah. but it was it was true that some authorities wouldn't allow it yeah. is it because and you know I guess going back to the devils it's this idea of you, you're kind of mixing religion with yes. this kind of obscene images yeah. is that yeah. what the particular problem was with the devils yes absolutely yeah. uh, there were some traditional censorship concerns so some of the torture sequences mm. involving Father Grandier where his, uh, yes. his legs are being tortured and his tongue is being pricked mm. all fairly common censorship problems that we we'd seen on uh, other horror films in the 60s came yeah. into play there were also some sexual elements that were challenging for the BBFC in uh, the early 70s but I think the main difficulty for us and also for the studio was that conflation of sexual imagery yes. with religion so. and there's that scene obviously the famous infamous scene now the mm. rape of Christ which yeah. was cut from, from yeah. the movie and it's yeah. still, it still yeah. doesn't exist within the, the cut of the film right now no, even on DVD right. does yeah, it yeah, yeah. Um, what happened when sort of uh, during the birth of home video then in terms yeah. of what happened to the devils what happened sort of going forward yeah well the, the, the story of the devils becomes sorrier and sorrier as time goes on mm. because once it had been released in the UK of course it then had to have a release in America in America, yes. they have a rating system with an R rating, which means under 17s must be accompanied, and they have an X rating, which mm-hmm. means no admission to, to under 17s. It's now called the NC 17 rating. Yes. The problem was that fairly early on in the new American rating system, the X started to get associated with pornography and right. it developed quite a bad reputation mm-hmm. which meant that films classified X in practice couldn't get releases because the chain cinemas wouldn't take them. Surprise, surprise given the sexual content of the devils and the mixing of the sexual content with religion, yes. it got an X from yeah. the MPAA um, and that was a problem so the film had to be cut 
to get an R rating in the States, and that saw the loss of another six minutes of material on top of what the board had cut. Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to home video in the early 80s, the reason the uh, the version of the film that got put out was the American R-rated version. Yes. So, so by the early 80s, what consumers were getting here wasn't just what the BBFC had passed, but the BBFC version already cut, mm. minus another six minutes of material. So the version that hit the video shelves here in the early 80s was a really, really neutered version of the right. film. Right, kind of an, M an MPAA yeah, version. Yeah, an MPAA R-rated cut of the film. So w when when the video was seen here in the 1980s, some of the examiners who remembered the film from the uh, 70s were saying, hang on. You know, <laughs> there was more of this yeah, orgy. <laughs> this, exactly. You know, this uh, this is no problem at all for us now at 18. But yes. part of the problem, it's, part of the reason it's no problem at 18 is because it's just, there's nothing there anymore. Yes. Yeah. You, you would expect that perhaps the cut material would come back, but mm -hmm. that hadn't come back. And there are additional um, American cuts, so it's a very heavily cut down version of the film. And it wasn't until the 90s when the BBC showed the death on television as part of a uh, I think it was called a forbidden weekend right. or a banned season one of those kind of events they yeah. do from time to time that they dug out the original UK X-rated cinema release and showed that on BBC2 um, interestingly with an introduction by our director James Furman ah. who was uh, quite a supporter of the film and was quite keen to see that American material reinstated so he, he, he ran a short uh, introduction in which he memorably said that um, you can't impose taste on Ken Russell, <laughs> and, and as a result, the uh, you know he was very keen to see the uh, as far as it could be restored version of the film show. In America, Warner Brothers were so outraged, the head of Warner Brothers was so outraged by the film that they cut a further four minutes and twenty seconds, and uh, to my very great regret, it is the the American version. Uh, that's out on video in Britain, and I think it's a great pity. They were attempting to impose their idea of good taste on this film and really transformed it into a, into a different kind of film. You can't impose good taste on Ken Russell. Russell is Russell, and it's a lost cause. You've got to give him his head to some extent. He's a one-off. That's really interesting because yeah. you, you kind of I, I kind of think of now as James Furman seemed to have had a, a, mm. a reputation as being the slightly more conservative end of things. Yeah, I mean James was and wasn't conservative. He, yeah. he he tended to be conservative or seem as if he was very conservative when he felt that a film was, shall we say, exploiting yes. more sensationalist material. But James could be quite a strong defender of some relatively strong material mm. if he felt it was justified by context. Yeah, and in the case of the devils I think he liked the film and he liked Ken Russell uh, and had worked with Ken Russell on some of his more contentious films during the 70s and 80s right. so so he was quite keen on the devils and he was keen on seeing it restored as far as was possible mm -hmm. and in the 90s the only version that was available was the original cinema version yes. uh, that was dug out for those BBC screenings and then put on home video but of course that uh, material cut in the 70s including including The Rape of Christ, still seemed to be missing. Yes. Until, of course, Mark Commode found it. Yes. <laughs> and and then, then the problems the, the problems merely got worse. Absolutely. And yeah. I've spoken to Mark about it, and he says, obviously, mm. that the, the BBFC have been quite supportive of, mm. of, of reinstating that mm -hmm. scene, but it's, it's been problems with Warner Brothers over in America, Yeah, the... Um, once Mark found the footage, mm. and I'm sure he's given you the full story of mm. how long that took and how he tracked it down, obviously it was quite exciting for everyone because yeah. you would assume perhaps, especially with a British film, that if material had been cut in the 60s or 70s, more likely than not that footage has vanished yes. and it's not going to be possible to find it again. So it was quite exciting for Mark and for Ken and for, you know, for various people to think, oh, this footage that everyone assumed had been lost. Yeah. Does exist. So the footage was partially restored. I don't think quite everything was put back in, but the sequences that Ken felt most strongly about, including mm. the Rape of Christ sequence, Mark was able to work with the original editor mm -hmm. uh, from the film uh, to put that footage back in. And they did produce a director's cut version of the film. Right. Um, permission was given for this uh, largely restored version of the film to be premiered at the NFT. That's right. In London, and Mark did an interview with uh, Cam Russell on stage. Uh, Mark 
um, slightly embarrassingly knew that I was there in the audience because it was interesting <laughs> to see it and then during the Q&A he put me somewhat on the spot oh, and no. said uh, I don't think the BBFC would have a problem with this footage anymore um, I think we've got Craig from the BBFC <laughs> in the audience Craig that's right isn't it <laughs> so I was I was forced to sort of you know, give, 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 give the film the all clear <laughs> on in the a spot. purely informal yeah in an informal <laughs> context on the spot after just having seen the film for the first time mm. but uh, yeah I think in terms of uh, I can't remember when that was it was sometime in the it 2000s it was 2004 I believe yeah, yeah. that's right um, I think at that point uh, I, 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 I certainly thought and again it hasn't been formally submitted to the BBFC that w- it was unlikely to be a problem for us mm. according to modern standards and what's probably helped also is the, uh, the, the, the repeal of the blasphemy law in England which uh-huh. means that that kind of question mark doesn't hang over the film but, but it was you know it was good for Ken to have have an opportunity to finally see the film mm. more or less as he'd intended mm-hmm. um, and everyone I think at the time expected that this will see the director's cut of The Devils being yeah. released. That hasn't happened. I think the main reasons it hasn't happened is that the um, the, the studio behind the film are nervous about it. It's yeah. probably partly because they think it would get an NC-17 rating mm-hmm. uh, from the MPAA, mm-hmm. uh, which is going to make it difficult for them to distribute, but also because some of that restored material um, is challenging yes. in terms of religion and the bringing together of religion and sex, that, that, that it, it, it's not necessarily something they're happy to be too closely associated with, which means that now that director's cut version of the film is rarely screened. Yes. It has been screened a few times here, um, usually at the NFT and usually in the past with uh, Ken Russell present. Yes. But for the time being, that version is not available on DVD mm. um, and you can only see it at special screenings. It's really interesting. Um, is it safe to say then that, uh, that in, over in America, the MPAA and also studios and distributors, by the sound mm. of it, they are still a little bit more conservative i suppose when it comes to sexual content and religious content yes i think i think that's partly because of the strength of religious feeling in parts of the us yes. i mean it's it's probably true to say that um if you were to show the longer version of the devils in you know i don't know let's say la or new york yeah. it would probably be okay yeah uh, but if you're trying to show it in other parts of the us it might cause more controversy even yes. though it's a, it's quite an old film but also more practically um, a lot of the cinema chains still treat the nc17 much in the way that they used to treat the x mm-hmm. rating and you, you, your your multiplex cinemas your chain cinemas just have a blanket policy of not showing nc C seventeen material. Wow. Yeah. Um, so if you try to release a film with the most restrictive rating, it's going to be no kind of release at all. Mm. So there is a sort of commercial problem there as well as a social, of course, and religious problem. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts personally, Craig, on the movie? Do you like the movie? Yeah, I, I like the film a great yeah. deal. I think it's. Um, as James Furman said in his introduction, it is it is very Cam Russell. Yeah. You know, aspects <laughs> of it are over the top, mm-hmm. but they are over the top in a way that you would expect Ken to do. Yeah. But I do think it's a beautifully photographed film. It really you know, the, is, isn't the, it? The, the set designs and the costumes, you know, the, that was Derek Jarman, wasn't it, doing yes. the sets? Um, it, the film looks fantastic visually, mm-hmm. and I think underneath that Exterior, which in some places looks slightly silly and camp now. It's a bit yeah. creaky, you know, with, yeah. with all the nuns tearing their clothes off and, and that yeah. kind of stuff. Underneath that, I think there is a serious message. Yeah. And, and I think uh, aspects of that message about religion being misused, misappropriated, yeah. manipulated, hypocrisy of some people using religion for their own political ends. Mm. I think in some respects, its message is just as relevant now, maybe more relevant now mm-hmm. than it was in, in 19. 71. Yeah. But no, absolutely. I think it's, and it, it still packs a punch. It does actually. It yeah. still works, yeah, doesn't I it? Think it's still it does, shocking. Yeah. Uh, do you think then, so going, you know, as to whether or not there'll ever be a full director's cut of it on DVD over mm. here, mm. that's up to the American studio yeah. by the sounds of it. Uh, is yeah, it? at the end of the day, it's, it's mm-hmm. their movie and they right. can do with it what they want. All right, I can right, say right. is uh, if they choose to do something with it, I don't think it will be a problem mm. for the BBFC. Interesting. Uh, let me ask you briefly then about The Exorcist as mm. well then, because another movie. Movie which 
almost became mythic. I mean, I remember mm. growing up and hearing, you know, oh, it's mm. been banned or has it been banned? Mm. And then there were different cuts of it, etc. Mm. What was the kind of initial reaction? What were the BBFC's thoughts when The Exorcist was first shown? Well, interestingly, given how contentious it's become since yes. and, and the reputation it developed, the BBFC really didn't have any problem with it at all Interesting. when it first came in. Yeah. So it came in in 1974, and you might think it would have gone through multiple screenings and yeah. people would have been consulting about it. But in, in fact, it was simply submitted. The examiners thought it was fine. Mm -hmm. The BBFC secretary, Stephen Murphy, thought it was fine. And, and they passed it X. Mm. So it really didn't go through much of a process. There wasn't any deep thought about it at the time. It was just seen as a well-made, impressive studio movie right. that was suitable for adults to watch. Yeah. And so it was passed X without any cuts. Um, the, the the difficulties came after it was released. Again, they were pr probably provoked in part by the hysteria there had been at US screenings oh, with yeah. all these reports of people fainting or having to be taken away or thinking they were possessed. Yes. There were all kinds of sort of lurid stories. <laughs> uh, and that led to a similar, perhaps at a lower level, but a similar kind of reaction here, mm -hmm. which encouraged this uh, feeling and this sense that that, you know that the film was very powerful which it undeniably is yes. but also that there was something you know dark forces at work yeah. so it was all very good from a you know from a publicity great marketing view, great yeah. marketing <laughs> and the more of that you get the more people are going to want to go and see the film for themselves so yeah. you know it was hugely popular hugely mm -hmm. successful but but again it did lead to a lesser extent than the devils to some local authorities taking an interest in it yeah. and again it was it was banned by a few local authorities although far fewer than uh, in the case of the devils right um, and then it went on to continue to play in cinemas through most of the 70s to yeah. be honest I mean by the end of the 70s the exorcist was still playing and because of its uh, because of its nature, it became a, a classic sort of midnight movie. Uh -huh. so, you know, it was often screening at weekends and, you know, 12 o'clock screening at this cinema, which all just adds to the the sort of atmosphere around it. It but, does. But, but yeah, really, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a problem for the BBFC in the 70s, and it only became a problem in the 1980s with home video. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. as so and many things do. Where, <laughs> exactly, and that was where the, uh, where, where the difficulties came. Yes. Um, I think, uh, contrary to popular opinion, um, or popular memory, um, The Exorcist was released on video right. in 1980 by Warner Home Video. At the time, there was no requirement for videos to be classified. Mm. That was something that was only brought in by the Video Recordings Act. And the Video Recordings Act, because there were so many tapes already on the shelves, it wasn't possible to say that overnight everything has to be classified or taken off the shelves. Yeah. That would have led to, you know empty video shelves yeah. so when the Video Recordings Act came in it was introduced in 84 it came into effect in 85 mm -hmm. and there was a staggered system whereby the BBFC had to work through the backlog as well as viewing all the new titles coming right. up so the deadline for The Exorcist to be classified or taken off the shelves was 1988 mm -hmm. so, so The Exorcist was available to rent from 1980 to 1988 so it had already yeah. been on the shelves for quite a while uh, but then under the Video Recordings Act, the BBFC had to consider whether whether we felt it could be formally classified mm. and especially applying this additional test in the Video Recordings Act about its suitability for viewing in the home. Right, yeah. And I think there, uh, well, there were multiple concerns. One was with the Video Recordings Act being relatively new. The BBFC didn't want the first thing it did to be classifying the kind of videos that had caused <laughs> the controversy in the first place. Mm. You know, that's that's quite challenging presentationally. But I think that test of suitability for viewing in the home, because The Exorcist was still a relatively recent film, mm -hmm. and because it has a child protagonist right. who engages in quite shocking behaviour um, in quite a difficult context, there was a concern the, the film was perhaps more likely than other horror films to attract younger viewers, even if we classified it 18, yeah. and that there was a strong potential, given how disturbing and how impactful it is, that some viewers, especially younger kids who got hold of the film, might be 
quite seriously disturbed by it. You yeah. know, particularly younger viewers who who, who do believe in uh, demonic possession. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was there was a concern that the film might be too powerful. In a sense, it wasn't that the BBFC thought it was a bad film mm. or that it was uh, an unpleasant film or an mm-hmm. exploitative film. I think the board's always been clear that we think it's a good film, yeah. it's a well-made film, and the problem is that it's it's very powerful or it can be right. very powerful. Absolutely. And that did mean that in 1988, the deadline came and went yeah. for The Exorcist to be classified. The BBFC didn't actually ban it because the BBFC didn't want to ban it. Mm. Um, but instead, the BBFC uh, took the approach of simply not classifying it. Right. I know it's a bit of you know, <laughs> dancing on the head of a needle. Uh, but, but, but The Exorcist was never actually formally issued with a ban. You mm. know, if, we, if we reject a film and refuse to classify it, we add it to our list of rejected films. Yes. We send a letter to the company saying your film has been rejected. That never happened with The Exorcist. With The Exorcist, we simply said uh, to Warner Home Video that we don't think now is the time to pass. It, but you know, let's let's keep talking about this. Mm-hmm. And so, over the years, there were conversations between the BBFC and Warner's about when when might be the right time to do it. Um, various other things happened over the years that made it more difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, the BBFC was asked to look at it at the height of those allegations of uh, satanic abuse. Right, you remember that was very much in the media. So yeah, perhaps that may not have been the best time to classify. The Exorcist. Then the Video Recordings Act was amended to make it stricter in mm-hmm. 1994. Again, not a great time to be passing a film as well known and problematic as The Exorcist. But in the end, uh, 1998, James Furman, who'd been the one effectively keeping this de facto yes. restriction on the video, um, announced that he was stepping down and we were getting a new president and a new director. And that seemed like a good a good opportunity to Mm -hmm. have another look at The Exorcist. And, of course, I think Warner's realised that it was coming up for a for an anniversary. That's right, it was its 25th. 25th. Yeah, Yeah, so there was 25th anniversary. It was put back in cinemas with a new 18 classification replacing the old Cinema X Mm. because, as I said, it had never been prohibited in cinemas. Um, And that gave us a good opportunity for a fresh group of people to have a new look at uh, the video version. Ah, That's really... So it wasn't in any way caught up in the kind of video nasties uh, era or anything like that? No. No. I mean, the the, the video nasties in general turn tended to be um, you know I don't want to sound dismissive because there were some interesting films in there but they tended to be less high profile sure. films smaller films yeah. lower budget films uh, sometimes people lump the exorcist in with mm. the video nasties but it was never on the video nasty list and mm-hmm. I think that's probably because it's a you know in many respects a big mainstream yeah. studio film you know an Oscar film yeah uh, it, so, was, it so, was a blockbuster exactly, almost wasn't exactly. it exactly yeah. and, and even it's a earliest uh, release on video without a BBFC certificate was a massive yes. massive seller it was a very popular title yes. and I think that was one of the reasons as well why the, why the BBFC was very nervous not only about classifying the film for video but taking the easy option of maybe cutting it uh-huh. because you know when it was looked at in the 1980s yes. some examiners said well maybe uh, maybe we can make some trims to the film yes. and I think uh, in fairness and uh, th- this probably reflects well on James that James preferred this is James Furman sorry yes. uh, James preferred to uh, not classify it rather than start messing about with it because James said do you really want to cut a film as well known and widely seen as The Exorcist mm. especially when it's um, such a good film Yes. So I think he preferred to, you know, put it in the drawer right. and forget about it rather than rather than make cuts to the film. Fair enough. There's uh, what's interesting about it as well is that obviously there is now a kind of there's the version you've never seen yeah. with extra scenes, yeah. but of course they weren't cut for sort of sensorial reasons, no, right? They were just no. creative choices. Yeah. The, 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 the weird thing is sometimes. Yeah, it, it's got this slightly awkward title, the version you've never seen before. And I think a large part of the reason for that is because the version that you had seen before, the version released in cinemas yes. and initially on video, that was William Friedkin's director's cut. Yes, and he the was director's cut is the shorter happy. one. For yeah, the once. short version, yeah. the version you've always seen, is the director's cut. Mm. Um, but there had been rumours for many years about these missing sequences, and obviously people get very excited about them. And I think these missing sequences 
difference is they were taken out partly for pacing reasons, yeah. partly in the case of the, the spider walk sequence, yes. which I think people had seen stills of, because the effects weren't quite up to it. At the exactly. Time. And exactly. the original version of that scene, because the effects didn't work well, undermined the power of the film. So I think, yeah, there were creative reasons for taking them out, but William Peter Blatty, the film's uh, writer and producer, was keen on these sequences because right. he wanted more more exposition. Mm. So um, shortly after the anniversary re-release, again, Mark was yes. very... <laughs> Dr. Kermode Dr. got involved. Dr. Kermode got involved, <laughs> and then it was decided that it would be good to allow William Peter Blatty to see his version of the film. Yeah. Uh, but you couldn't call it a director's cut, so it, and calling it the producer's cut seems rather weird. Yes, so, kind of the writer's uh, yeah, cut, exactly, isn't it? the writer's cut. Yes. So they came up with this uh, idea of the version you've never seen before. But unlike The Devils, where the missing footage was because of censorship, yes. uh, in the case of The Exorcist, it wasn't. So it meant that when we finally saw this extended version of the film, we were able to pass that mm. just at 18 in line with the, the, the original version. It's really interesting to think that, mm. yeah, even back in the, when it was originally first out then, it was there, there were no cuts made to it or no. anything like that. No, no, the B- yeah, that, that's yeah. right. No, the BBFC's never banned The Exorcist and the BBFC's never made any cuts to it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And now it's kind of available where you can get both versions. Can't yes, you, that's right. Both versions are available. We did eventually pass it for video in 1999. Um, at the time, our our, uh, our director Robin Duval he'd actually been involved in looking at whether the film could be shown on Sky Television mm. in the early 90s and amusingly Robin when he was working at the ITC was in favour of The Exorcist being screened mm. on television but he was told in no uncertain terms by our own James Furman that uh, screening the film on television while it was still unavailable on home video was going to lead to all manner of problems but it did perhaps mean given Robin's support for the film right. in his TV regulatory capacity that um, once he took over as uh, director of the BBFC mm. it was obvious what was going to happen yes. and so finally in 99 the film was passed right. It's interesting as well I mean compared to The Devils The Exorcist does have quite a sort of pro really yeah. just pro-Catholic yeah. kind of message yeah. behind it doesn't it yeah. I wonder if that's why that's kind of easier I think film. that yeah I think I, I, I think the, the, the fact that the film takes religion very seriously yes has been part of its problem in terms of those worries we've had about whether it may uh, affect younger and more vulnerable viewers who are you mm-hmm. know who, who who buy into what the film's saying because it's so powerful and effective from that point of view but it also assists the film in that it's a film that tends to have garnered more support from religious people mm-hmm. than the devils because yes. although the devils has a serious message it's more a message about politics and religion yes. and the misuse of religion whereas the interesting thing about the exorcist is everything else is tried by scientists Mm. and medics and it's only finally the exorcist that can resolve the problem because it takes it takes the issue of evil entirely seriously and literally yeah and and it it can be a very powerful film yeah for, for 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 religious believers i remember taking a friend of mine who's a uh, practicing Catholic to see it on its 25th anniversary re-release yeah. and I was a little nervous yeah. about taking him to see this film but actually he found it incredibly powerful and what he liked about the film was that it, it confirmed his beliefs. Absolutely, you know, the priests come in and save the day. It's not an anti-religious film. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. the priests save the day you know? and if you if you are religious it's uh, it perhaps has that added level of power yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. which works really well. Um, so finally then, I mean, you know, it's interesting, we've been looking at a lot of these movies like kind of occult movies movies that dabble with Satanism and religious evil you know obviously times have changed and do you think that movies that in any way kind of um, comment on blasphemy or Mm. or could be considered blasphemous is that still a problem for the BBFC and for censorship these days no um, Mm. not not that long ago, the uh, blasphemy laws were repealed mm. in England and Wales, so it's no longer a technical legal issue. Right. In the past, uh, in the 1980s, into the 1990s, there were some films that were cut, uh, mm-hmm. or even in one case rejected, for blasphemy, because yeah. it was still a live, um, a live uh, legal issue for us. Uh, that's no longer there, and I think unless a film raised 
significant harm issues, mm. it's likely that we would now say, well, the best we can do is issue a warning about it, and if this is likely to offend you or upset you, then don't watch it. Mm. All we can do is be as clear as we can yeah. about what the film can, contains. But I think those kind of issues of religious sensitivity, blasphemy, while we take it seriously in deciding what classification to award, mm-hmm. I think we'd very much prefer to leave it to viewers to make their own minds. Up. Yeah, I think we're living yeah. in a slightly more kind of secular world these days, yes, aren't we, exactly. than we were before. Yeah, yeah. Um, Craig, thank you so much. Um, if people want to find out kind of more information about these kind of things, I know obviously you've got your website, you've also yep. got a podcast, haven't you? In yep. fact, you, you, you discussed The Exorcist, I, I believe, I on think, one of the em- have, episodes yeah. of your podcast, because yeah. yeah, I had yeah, a listen. Yeah, yeah. So people can sort of find that in all the yeah. usual places, yeah. can they? Yeah. Perfect. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me. No problem. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a big thank you to my two brilliant guests, Craig Lapper from the BBFC and, of course, Anna Bugatskaya. So, what did you think of this week's episode? And what do you think of Ken Russell's The Devils? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the movie. Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. Don't forget you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, on Letterboxd. And you can join the discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group. And that can be found on Facebook. You can find all episodes of this podcast over on our website. Simply go to evolutionofhorror.com. We also have a written section on there, a blog section. We've got some brilliant brilliant uh, written pieces, reviews, essays, that kind of thing that have been going up in the last couple of weeks. And if you want to be involved in that, if you want to write something for the website, please do just get in touch with me. Drop me an email, evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Libsyn, Spotify, and various others. Don't forget to subscribe to us and please do spread the word about us. Tell your friends and family about us. Tweet about us if you can. And if you haven't done so already we'd really appreciate if you can spare us the time to give us a little rating on apple podcasts which really helps the podcast get discovered by new listeners okay well where are we at right now well as it's coming up to christmas we're taking a week's break from the occult series so there'll be no occult episode next week however we'll be back in early january for a very very exciting new episode because the next episode in our occult series is one of the most beloved and famous and popular and wonderful and perfect horror movies ever made, William Friedkin's The Exorcist. Now, when it comes to talking about movies like Ken Russell's The Devils and William Friedkin's The Exorcist, there really is only one person in the world who you can ask about these two films. One person who I would say is pretty much the world authority on these two films, particularly The Exorcist. So join us in January for a very special episode in which I'm going to be joined by Wittertainment's very own Dr. Mark Kermode to discuss very briefly Ken Russell's The Devils and then in depth William Friedkin's The Exorcist. Join us then for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. <laughs>